Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Equay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Returning to the show tonight by popular demand is my friend and colleague, Bryn Blankenship, who specializes in the fascinating field of spiritual regression. Bryn is a certified master hypnotherapist, an international certified hypnosis instructor, and an author. She is also the founder of Hypnotic Solutions Hypnosis Center, located in the coastal town of Wilmington, North Carolina. Bryn specializes in clinical and transpersonal hypnosis, past life regression, and life between lives spiritual regression. For tonight's discussion, Bryn will explain life between lives, where a client can experience their soul's existence in the spirit world while under hypnosis. It's a regression technique requiring skill and expertise, and Bryn is one of the very best in the field. So my first question to Bryn Blankenship was, what exactly is a life between lives regression? And here is what she had to say. So a life between lives is where we go between our lifetimes in the spirit world. You know, we don't just die and that's it. We leave this earthly life and we go home. So our soul continues on after it leaves our body and it goes to the between. But in the between, there's a lot of activity. There's school, you know, there are other souls that we interact with, a lot of planning. There's just a lot of structure that occurs in the spirit world. Well, I think that that's a very interesting point to make because I don't think a lot of people understand that there is structure in the spirit world. It's that, not all one place that you just go to right. and just kind of hang there. Right. That's the thing. You just don't float around? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might float a little bit, you know, but you've got things to do. You've got places to be. There's a lot of activity going on up there. So it's the place where we go, where our souls reside in between our incarnations. Yes. So how does that differ from a past life regression? A past life is a previous life that we've experienced, whether on Earth or another planet. Okay, so then your incarnations may not always be on Earth, and you could wind up incarnating on another world then. Yes. So can you then help us, Bryn, understand a little bit about what these other worlds or these other incarnations are like that are not Earth-bound? Okay, so there are some other planets that are very Earth-like and bodies that are similar to human Earth bodies. And then there are some planets that are telepathic planets where we don't even really have a body. You're a ball of energy and you communicate just through thought. There are water planets, water worlds. There is a planet that clients have talked about that's the orange planet. You know, and they do their best to describe what they're experiencing, but they're getting so much information in a three-dimensional kind of way. You know, they're doing the best they can to describe it to me when I'm sitting over there across from them, just taking notes and listening to what they're describing. I think that it's important that the audience understand that it's not all just Earth. It's not all just coming here. Although I tell my clients that Earth is a very difficult school. Yes. A very challenging school, so that's why a lot of souls come here, because the rate and pace of learning can be expedited. But other planets, other worlds, other life forms, you mentioned a water world. Mm -hmm. Very, very intriguing. There was one um, that's coming to mind where they had, they had a human body, but it was kind of short and squatty, except instead of having two eyes, they seemed to have like one eye in the middle of their forehead. I mean, you know, sometimes we get really graphic descriptions, and yep. then other times we don't get so much of a description about their body as much as the environment around them. But there are a lot of similarities. If we compare notes, if you had a lot of past life regressionists and life between lives hypnotherapists sitting around talking, there would be a lot of correlation between all of our descriptions to be able to identify the orange planet or the water world. I had one where um, the client went to a world where the intelligent beings were bird-like, mm -hmm. but they were highly intelligent, able to communicate, but they did not look like humans. They were very bird-like, and I don't mean small birds. They were four to five feet maybe in height. So it's very interesting. It's just this whole diversity of what's out there, and, and there's this diversity of experiences. It's fascinating. It is, because as humans... Many humans think that this is all there is. We live, we die, and that's it. They don't like to think that there could be other 
beings out there on other planets. But also, it's important to mention that we have those lifetimes on those other planets, and then we come to Earth, and we may bring some of those skills with us. So you might be drawn to a certain activity or a certain modality, let's say, that you actually develop those skills on another planet. So for example, someone that's drawn to energy work, that's because it's familiar to them because they've done that on another planet. And I've had guides explain to us how on those telepathic planets or those energy planets where souls will play with energy and experiment, how they'll do that in preparation for coming to Earth at a later time during one of the incarnations where they'll be using those skills. Or a creative planet where they, they'll they create just for the sake of creating. And they use thought or skills and abilities that they have access to, talents that they have on those planets that help them create. And then they'll bring that to Earth in, in a way that works with you know what we have capability for on this planet. And these skills, Bryn, along with the incarnations, they can also learn these skills or expand on these skills in the spirit world as well. Yes. So it's not just limited to incarnations on planets, but this is also an aspect that can be experienced and realized up in the spirit world between lives. Yes, because their clients will describe I mean, they say they're classrooms in the spirit world where they're learning something with their soul group on a particular topic. Maybe it's working on the environment or something, you know, along those lines in preparation for coming to Earth where they're going to implement those skills that came out of one of my sessions. And they were really working on some special ideas that were important and timely for this time in the world's evolution to help the planet. How would you answer the question, Bryn, if a client came to you and asked you, what are the benefits to me of having an LBL session? If someone were going to come to me for a session, I would want to make sure that they understood that they have to be a willing participant in the process because I don't do this to them and they have to be able to let go and go into that deeper space. And I'm going to guide them and I'm going to use my voice and give them suggestions they, they're going to use their imagination, their ability to relax and let go and go into that deeper space. And they can connect with their guides. They can find out why they're here. You know, what's their purpose for being? Why were they born this time? Why they chose this body? How this body may differ from other bodies that they've experienced or had in the past. They can learn about relationships. Maybe there's a theme that they're working on through a series of lifetimes that is going to be completed in this life, or perhaps it's not going to be completed in this life, but they're getting a lot of the learning. They can learn more about the afterlife, like where do we go after we die, which gives people a lot of peace so that there's not so much fear around death. How about the soul's character? In other words, I think a lot of people fall into the trap that they believe that their character or their ego as a human is also their character or their ego as a soul. So when you have an LBL, are you able to distinguish between the the character traits of an incarnation versus your core character traits as an infinite being as a soul? Yes. In fact, one of the questions that I might ask would be, what are your soul characteristics that you carry with you from lifetime to lifetime? You know, how is that different from the person that's sitting in my chair right now? Souls have a, an energy about them. They're distinctive. They're individual. Not all souls are cut from the same cloth. You know, they're, they're each unique to themselves. So they have character. They have uh, a presence about them. They have a personality. Mm -hmm. They have a soul personality and you have a human personality. Now, your human personality is going to change from lifetime to lifetime because you choose different lives and different experiences in a body that are going to give you an experience, that are going to give you something that's going to help you grow. So each combination of soul and human being are going to be unique. You know, no two combinations of soul and human personality are the same. 
So you're going to experience something different through each one. And there may be a tendency that you might need to incarnate as a softer personality type to learn a lesson. You might do that a couple of times. And then you might incarnate as more of a more difficult personality type to learn what it feels like to be experiencing the opposite of that. So the soul, in essence, comes down, incarnates from the spirit world, and it actually takes on a role. Yes. There's a melding that the soul joins with the human mind, and there's a partnership that takes place with the mind, the body, and the soul. And they work together to help achieve a human life. So they're so, in partnership with one another. So and how does someone then experience an LBL? What's that process like? If they come to you and say, hey, Bren, I'd like to schedule an appointment for a life between lives. How do you explain the process to them? So what's going to happen is we're going to talk a little bit. I'm going to find out a little bit about you and I'm going to get your questions that you want answered. You know, just, just a, a couple of questions that you want answered from the session, because I also have a list of things that I'm going to ask once you go under. And I ask you to bring a list of about 10, about 10 key people in your life positive and negative, who were a big influence on you so that if they come up in the session, I'll have a little shorthand as to who they are and what their relationship is to you and how you feel about that person. I ask for a description about that personality, you know, a family member and let's say it's your brother and this person is, has a good sense of humor, always laughing. You know, that tells me how you see them. So that if they show up in your past life or your life between lives portion, you know, I get a hand, I can get a feel for that. Or if they're very difficult, then that lets me know how you take that person, you know, in their personality. And I also look for, as I'm listening to you describe other people, if you have negative information about each of those people, that's telling about you as a person, as a personality. And we may talk with your guides about that once we get to the between to find out more. So you try to understand the dynamics of the people that they're interacting with. In current life. In a current life, right. And to, I guess we even go into a past life or the life between lives. Okay. So, you know, we talk. I just want to find out more about them as much as I can. And then we're going to do a past life session. And we're going to do the past life. It takes about two hours. And... That's like a memory warm up. That's a way for the client to go into that space, pull up a memory, share it with me. It's relevant. It'll make sense as to why that past life came up. And then they're going to go into the death scene at the end. They're going to cross over into the between. We'll get to review the life and we'll also get to talk with their guides in that portion. And then They'll come back. Usually when I'm working with someone from out of town, we'll do the past life on one day. And then the next day we'll do the LBL or maybe two days later, depending on their schedule. But often we have to do it the next day because they're, they're coming from far away places. So the day of the LBL, we'll do a brief review of anything that came up overnight for them. We'll cover their questions for this session, see if anything else has come up and I'll take them back through childhood, back through the womb, just to pull up some happy memories, you know, just like we did with the past life. We're going to go into their most immediate past life to get through it, to hit the highlights, to get to the spirit world, because here we're going to spend most of the session the second day in the spirit world. So we're going to go and explore and find out, you know, we're going to work with their guides and let the guides take them to the places they need to go to. So it's a two-step process then. The first session is a past life regression. Yes. And then the second session is the actual life between lives. And the second session, the LBL, contains an abbreviated past life regression as part of the, um, the session? Yes. And that is to help open that client up to get them used to working that way. You know, you're in the chair, you're under, you're talking with me, describing to me what you're getting. and you're in that space for a long time. It might feel like a timelessness when you're experiencing the session, but when you're experiencing the past life on the first day, you know, that's two hours, but you're in a state of timelessness. You're getting used to describing what you're experiencing to me 
and I'm sitting across the room from you and I'm trying to stay on the same page with you with what you're describing. You know, and I'm connected energetically. I get a feel for where you are and with what you're describing. I understand what what's going on. And if I don't, I'll ask more questions. And then on the day that we do the LBL, we just need to get through the past life as a way to access the between. So the past life session, that session is important because the client is becoming acclimated and familiar with the trance depth being yes. in hypnosis. Yes. So without that, if a client just tried to have an LBL, that it might be difficult for many clients because they're just not familiar or conditioned to be in that level of trance. And so therefore, the chances of the session being sub-optimized, those odds increase. Yes, okay. because you have a much richer experience when you do the past life first. I was taught by Michael Newton. This is Michael Newton's work you know, at the, at the basis of LBL. And he always recommended doing the past life. I feel like it's not fair to the client to not do the process the way it was meant to be because you're shortchanging them with, with the richness of the session. It's just a much fuller session with more information, more insight. When you're not allowing yourself the time that you need to do and follow the process, you're straining and pushing to get something that could flow much more easily. And when you start straining and pushing and trying to make it happen, that actually blocks the information from coming through and it makes it a more difficult session. Right. So it's for the benefit of the client. You're really, what you're saying is you're properly preparing them to ensure that they have an optimized session, that they get the most out of it and they are as prepared as they possibly can be to be able to hit those trance depths that are required in order to have the experience. Exactly. For most people, this is a one-time experience where you're going to have an LBL because there's cost involved. You know, we're spending, the practitioner is spending several hours with the client. Uh, we need to do the past life session the day before. That takes time. I can only energetically and to give the best to my client, I really only do one LBL in a day. It takes four hours, five hours. And, you know, I don't try to double them up. I don't try to make them quicker so I can get more in. I try to just give it the space that it needs. And when Michael Newton was doing this work, there was only himself to go to. And so you really only had one shot at it. And now that more people have been trained you know, through the Newton Institute. And I've been fortunate enough to be a trainer um, with the Newton Institute. Now, you know, there are those people that have had more than one experience with LBL. But I know that people put a lot of money, time, thought into coming to see me. So I want to make sure they get the best experience they can. And I don't want to limit them by not doing the past life session. It's really a key piece of the entire experience. Now, Bryn, what is hypnosis like? Now, we're talking about this requires hypnosis, being in deep trance states. So the next question some of the listeners may be asking is, well, what is this hypnosis process like? Am I knocked out? Am I being controlled? And why does hypnosis take us into the spirit world? But why don't we start with what hypnosis is like? Okay. First of all, we go in and out of hypnosis all day long. We go through the hypnotic state when we're waking up, you know, that little grogginess right before we wake up. Throughout the day, if we're daydreaming, that's a light state of hypnosis. Or if we're watching a movie and we're just so engrossed in the movie or playing a video game or reading a book, those are states of hypnosis, you know, some lighter than, than others. And then when you're going to sleep at night, you're passing through hyp the hypnotic state to go all the way to sleep. So what we're doing is guiding you into that deeper state where you have access to those deeper levels that provide information and awareness that can help you in your current life. So we're just helping connect you to information that's available once you're in that deeper place. Now, are they knocked out? Are you controlling them? No, I can't control them. I can't make them do anything that they don't want to do. So if they don't want to let go, if they don't want to follow the instructions that I'm giving them, there's nothing that I can do to make them go there. Right. They're in control at all times. 
and you're not knocked out. You'll hear everything around you, but you just won't care. You'll be in a state where if a plane flies over my office, one of my first offices was down by the airport, and sometimes planes would fly over, and the client would hear it, but it was like a sound that just was off in the distance, but they were aware that it was there. And then other times, they're just so focused on what information is coming through, they don't hear it at all. Right. And the reason why I asked about being knocked out is because of TV and the movies. Oh, yes. And the controlling aspect also, uh, you know, TV and movies, they make it appear that the person is completely at the will of the hypnotist or the practitioner. So I just wanted to make sure that we discussed that to kind of get that off the table. That comes up a lot. And I address that with the client in the pre-talk because I want to alleviate any concerns they may have. And I see some of the most horrific things on TV and when they're related to hypnosis, you know, <laughs> and it's like, no, that's not what we're doing. And then some people have the idea that people like Chris Angel and um, some of the others that are out there as entertaining as they are, you know, that is not what we're doing in a therapeutic hypnosis session or right. spiritual exploration session that, you know, that's, this is com something completely different. And in that relaxed state, you'll be able to access answers to questions that you have about yourself and about your life to enhance moving forward after the session. Yeah, I think it's important for the audience to understand that hypnosis is really a natural state of consciousness. As you yeah. mentioned before, we go in and out all the time. Oh, we do it all the time. Daydreaming is a trance state. Exactly. It's right. like a deeper state of daydreaming. Right. So on the same note, I'll explain that we're going to use your imagination as well because this information is going to come through you through your human mind. So it's going to use that library of information that's in your human mind to help it make sense. Some of the information that comes through you already knew. You already knew this about yourself. This is giving you that confirmation. So they may be surprised that their imagination played a factor and you can't turn it off. It's actually helpful to the process. Well, here's the thing that I found doing the work is that the word imagination has really been used in a way that makes it sound like it's not real. And what many do not understand, and I would even argue a lot of hypnotists don't understand, is your imagination is the language of your subconscious unconscious mind. And I explain to my clients the use of your imagination during a hypnosis session, whether it be past lives, life between lives, or even a clinical session, is very, very important. Exactly. Yes, and the imagination is important. So we're working with that part of the brain. You know, we have to get out of that analytical mind and into that creative side to get, have access to this information. Right. And what's coming to mind, too, is, you know how a songwriter, the music will flow through them and they'll write a song or they'll write lyrics and it flows from a higher source, a higher place. I call it channeling the song or channeling the music. Yes. Well, we're channeling the soul self. We're channeling the soul, communicating more fully in this human body to give us answers about ourselves at current life, at this point, this stage of our current life, so that we can take that information with us to move forward and have clarity and peace of mind and direction and enhanced sense of purpose, you know, why we're here, instead of having to die, go back to the spirit world, get information be born again, grow up, and then start living. It's like we're getting a life review at this stage to live out the remainder of our current life with more information than we had beforehand. Right. And it's really a beautiful process in doing this. The guides are very loving. They're very kind and compassionate and humorous. They might be teasing with the client to get them to lighten up, but they're very loving and they understand the difficulty they honor us for coming here to be here on this planet. Because this is not the easiest planet to be on. No, it's not. I can vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why did I sign up? To do this now, Brent, a question I get is, why does hypnosis take us into the spirit world? What is it about hypnosis that gets us to a past life or gets us into the spirit world? It's the method that we have to access the spirit world. Now, 
you know, we hear about near-death experiences where someone's had a traumatic event that caused them to have access to the white light and the beings that come. Maybe they're, you know, in an emergency room on a, um, a surgical table and the lights come. Well, the hypnosis is a way to access that without having some trauma that connects us to that place. It like, essentially connects us into that expanded consciousness then? Yes. So hypnosis, I mean, hypnosis has been used for centuries to get us into a deeper state, um, to relieve pain, heal the body, heal the mind. It's just a method that we've been able to access for centuries. Yes, it's very, very powerful. Now, another question that I get, and I'll pose this one to you. What if I go back to a life when I wasn't a good person? Is it safe yeah. to experience that life again? I know you get those same types of questions. So how do you respond to that? Well, first of all, you're not going to go somewhere that you're not supposed to. Your conscious mind, your subconscious mind are not going to take you to some place that's unsafe. Second of all, when you're re-experiencing the life, let's say it's a lifetime where you killed people. Maybe you were a killer. It was part of your job to kill people. Well, you're not actually in the life and you know that you died from that and you've come back again and you're here now. So you're able to to view it from another place, another way. And as you do, you start to have insight into that person. It's safe to view it because you're going to learn from it. There's a reason your soul is guiding you to that lifetime on that day to see it. But maybe you were a person that stole from people, not necessarily a killer, but just someone that did bad things to people. Well, this is going to give you the opportunity to re-experience that life from a higher viewpoint that's going to give you more insight. So the client is experiencing the memories and the emotions from that past life, but that experience is coming from a vantage point or a position of objectivity. Is that correct? Yes. You're able to observe it in an objective way. Okay. And you also have the perspective of soul. You're right. viewing it from a soul perspective instead of from the human experience of having been in it. Okay, so, but there is carryover from life to life because yes. I, I think it's a misconception by many that when you pass and you go up to the spirit world, you go back home, that you essentially completely cleanse and shake off everything from past lives, that there is nothing that's kind of just residual hanging on. Is that true, not true? Do you find that there is carryover? There is carryover. One of the guides explained it to me this way. We make a coat and we sew into the pockets of the coat all the necessary attributes and elements that we're going to need for the life that we're coming to live. And then we come and we're born and that information is in us. And then at some point in that life, we activate that information. So, you know, you've had all these past lives. Why does it take you in a past life session, why does it take you to this particular past life? Mm -hmm. Well, because that's the one that was going to have some element of something that you were going to need to work on in current life. So you brought those things with you to give yourself the opportunity to heal or understand or balance your state from those experiences when you got to the point where you're going to have the past life session or where you're going to run into some of the players from the past life in your current life that we're going to push some of those buttons that brought about the opportunity for healing. And also there could be multiple lives to master a lesson. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it takes many lifetimes to work on a lesson because there are, and each lesson that someone may be, may be working on, you know, it's not like a set number of lifetimes per lesson. Right. Some may take more than others. Sometimes we volunteer to come down and play a certain role to help someone else out with what they're learning. And then we learn by being on this side of it. Um, there can be many factors into planning out a life and to what, to what you're going to sew into that, that coat that you're going to come in, you know, this body being the coat, um, what you're going to come in to do. So you won't master your lessons in one lifetime then? <laughs> no. <laughs> Drat. <laughs> Now, I haven't had it happen but because uh, they didn't come into the office to have a session, but 
there may be some souls that choose to just have one lifetime here and that's it. Right. But they're usually not going to be coming in for an LBL session on their first lifetime. Not, not usually. They've got other things to do. Now, we talked a little bit about why a past life regression is necessary in order to connect to the spirit world. We had mentioned that this was a natural segue. It's being able to get the uh, the client acclimated and familiar with the process, being in trance, opening up the expanded consciousness. But now, what happens when they cross over and they're entering into the LBL? Where do they go first, typically? What happens when you pass away? Where Where do you land where do you land? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where do you float to? <laughs> so your soul leaves the body, the human body, and then it moves up. I say up, but it goes, right. it leaves and goes up to where it's greeted by loved ones. Often they're, they're greeted by a guide or sometimes they're greeted by a welcome party right away, like a big celebration. And there are those times where the soul may need to go to healing and restoration, like a healing space to restore their energy from a difficult past life, to release some of the negative or heaviness from that life before they can continue on in the LBL. And, you know, those are really beautiful spaces. Sometimes it can be like showers of light or it, it, there can be therapeutic spaces that are just really beautiful scenery. Right. It's whatever that client needs. It could be a light, just a color of light that they step into that infuses them and helps to bring healing. Those times that the soul is greeted by the welcome party, you know, it can be friends and loved ones that they recognize from the life just lived. It could be in a setting that is appropriate for the life just lived. It could be in a setting that is familiar to them because maybe they travel with these people a lot in lifetimes. So there's a set particular setting that's the most familiar to them as a group. So it's very have- varied then. I mean, it's... it's uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Very varied. Very varied. And um, I'm listening to what you're saying and explaining and... So this gets to the whole point we mentioned earlier in the discussion where there is a structure yes, that it just isn't catch as catch can when you pass away and just drift around, that there is a process, there is structure, there's an existence. And we have things to do up there. <laughs> and we have to get to them at the right time. Right. You know, right. time is um, relevant, but, um, you know, we're in the spiritual world time, which is very different than earth time. And so there, there's an order, there's a system to how things work there. Sometimes I'm thinking that we're going to take a client to a certain area of the spirit world, but I've learned to ask the guide if it's appropriate to take them there or if they have somewhere that they prefer to take them. Because I might be thinking that it's time to do the life review and the guide has, some, has something else in mind that I didn't know was going to happen. Or they'll say, no, we need to go over here first. They want to show me this and they might give them a glimpse into another past life that wasn't covered in the past life session or a glimpse of something that's really important for them to know before we continue on and do the actual life review of the the past life review and current life review. When they are in the spirit world, Brent, what is their awareness of themselves? Are they in a physical form, non-physical form? What is the typical sense of being they're in a non-physical form clients will describe light colors sometimes a way to get them to identify what they look like is to ask someone in their soul group to hold up a mirror to them so that they can get a, a sense of what they look like and and they'll describe their colors that make up their being the same with guides the guides may show up in a human form or they may show up as balls of light. You know, sometimes they'll show up as a certain figure, like a wise figure, an Indian or a wise man or, you know, something that's familiar to that client. So they can project a physical form then? They can project a physical form. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then they may, that guide may then peel off that layer and show their their light body, their light colors, you know, once the client has identified who that being is. When they go up to the spirit world, do they meet predominantly with one guide or 
can it be that there's multiple guides that they, they wind up interacting with? There's that primary guide that's with them through many of their lifetimes. But there may be other guides that will come in for a particular level of learning or a certain lesson or, or that help them with certain things. So if they have a specialty of something that they're doing that they work with here on Earth, they might have a guide that works with them on that. Like a medical doctor would have a special guide that helps them with their medical stuff, their specialties at work, in addition to their guide that helps them with other areas of their human life. You know, not only do they have their guide that helps them with life, but they have a specialty, a guide that would help them specifically with one area of the research that they're working on. Okay, and what about um, soul groups? question that I get a lot is, do I always incarnate with my soul group? Does everybody in my soul group always come down together for an incarnation? What has been your experience with your clients? You know, when I'm working and helping to identify some of the other um, people in their soul group, sometimes I have clients that are not able to identify anyone in their soul group. But most times clients are able to identify many members of their soul group, but not all. Okay. And then there are those few times where you get the client that's able to identify every single member of their group, their interactions, and just a lot of information in that area. You know, and in Michael Newton's books, you know, it goes into a lot of detail about soul groups. And I think people have the expectation that they're just easily going to access that information. But I think their analytical mind comes in a little bit in this part, and they're trying to make people fit into what they think their soul group should be. Yeah. But not all members of your soul group incarnate at the same time that you do and finish their life at the same time that you do. They may be overlapping or they may come in just for that, you know, just for that one chance meeting that changes your life at just the right moment. And then you don't see them again until a different lifetime. Now, you mentioned uh, Michael and uh, Michael Newton. Let me ask this question. Have you found that clients that have read Michael's books or even Brian Weiss's books, for that matter, if we go back to past lives, do they interfere? Do clients wind up experiencing or seeing based upon what is written in those books? Or do you find that once they get into that depth of trance, the books are really irrelevant? What happens is once they get into that depth of trance, they start to access the information and have a deeper understanding of what it means and how it relates to them. Because when they're reading it in the books, it may seem like one thing or another thing, but it's very different when you're actually experiencing it yourself. And then the times where the books may interfere is when a client is getting something and they start to analyze it with their, you know, because you still have your analytical mind with you. You can't turn your mind off. It's just right. sort of in the background. But when they start to second guess and say, well, wait a minute, when I read the book, here's what I thought it meant. And that can start to bring them up out of trance. So if I hear them speaking in, you know, there's certain language that they start to speak in, um, certain words they might use that let me know that they're starting to come up out of trance, then I need to deepen them and bring them back down and remind them to just let that go. So it's not a problem if someone's read the books, but it's also not necessary if people have read the books because Every LBL is going to be a little different, but the experiences are similar whether the clients have read the book or not read the book. And how about sensory perceptions? Um, I think also the books and also people watch these uh, sessions on YouTube, and the impression is that visual perception is first and foremost, and they're actually going to be sitting in like a movie theater and watching themselves on a big screen. So could you help describe a little bit about what sensory perceptions actually come into play? Is it is sight predominant or could it be kinesthetic? Could it be auditory? What's your experience with that? Everyone's different and it depends on how they process and how you process in your waking life is different than how you process information when you're under. So they may, some clients are very visual, but not all. Some clients do feel kinesthetically the information coming through them and they can give you great description yet they're not necessarily seeing it but they know the answer they just, it's like a deep sense of knowing and then there are some clients that can hear the answers being whispered as if their guide is just speaking to them um, and then they're relating the information to me 
So how it comes through can be different for, for each person. What I'm noticing is that when people read the books, it appears that the clients in the stories are very visual, but that's not necessarily the case. So, you know, if I'm going to write a session, write up a session into a story that someone's going to read, I'm going to take out the quiet parts where they weren't speaking. I'm going to take out some of the parts where they were trying to sort out information because, you know, this is four hours of an LBL and two hours of a past life session. That's six hours of information that I'm trying to condense down into a story to help someone understand what came out of that session. So it may appear that this was appearing visually because, you know, I've had those kinesthetic clients that give such great descriptive detail. So if you're reading that from the page that I wrote about the session, you're going to think that client was watching all of that, yet they weren't necessarily visually experiencing the session, yet they're getting great description. So they were feeling it and they had an emotional state. Yes. And, you know, the emotion comes through and they're moved in different parts when they're being greeted by their guides or greeting with greeting loved ones, you know, who have passed over that they're seeing again or, you know, a familiar friend. The emotion really does come through that they're experiencing when they're in session. How about, Bryn, past life or life between lives? the whole sense of knowing. In other words, there's just you just know about yourself. Can you just describe that a little bit, that sense of knowing? Yes, it's just that. It's a sense of knowing that just comes through, and the client just knows the answer to the questions that are being asked. And that's where that connection to the soul self is there, and the soul is just expressing itself to the client more freely without the analytical mind getting in the way and we really just have a deep connection, a nice, strong connection to the soul to express more in human form, in words, in descriptions of our soul's purpose and answers to the questions that the client has come in to, to learn about. So the conscious mind filter has essentially been set aside. Yes. Right. And so the soul self is able to come through. It's amazing to me, you know, when I do my sessions, is the the level of wisdom that comes through yes. when the soul self starts to speak it's really quite amazing and it's poetic sometimes they speak in such a beautiful poetic language what's also interesting too is when the soul begins to speak through the client about the client as if they're not there right you know it's really surreal mm -hmm. and it's very beautiful all at the same time and it's such an honor to, to have the privilege to be able to do this. I, I'm really grateful every single day that I get to do this. I yes. tell folks it's the best job anybody can ever do. It's just Because I don't have to go to work. I get to go to work. Yeah, it's amazing. It really is. Let me ask you this question. How about soulmates? Because a question I get a lot is, is my soulmate always in my incarnate lives? Are we together all the time? And is my soulmate always my wife, husband, partner, lover? No. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> you know, your soulmate is that soul that was sparked at the same time that you were sparked, you know, that you began. And there are those times where you're married to them. There are other times where it's your child or it could be your mentor. And then there are other times where they're not in your life at all, like they sit one out or, or maybe they incarnate and you sit one out. And you learn through that loss of not having that special someone in that current life. You learn what that feels like. Now, when I'm working with clients, it's just the client and I in the room, you know, and occasionally I've had someone ask, you know, can my spouse sit in on the session? And I, I don't do that. I don't do that with past lives, and I don't do that with life between lives. And the reason that I don't allow it, there are two reasons, actually. I don't need the disruption or the distraction of another party in the room just sitting and watching. You know, just having their breathing and knowing that you're being watched is going to make it more difficult for the right, client right. to go under. And the other thing is, 
I don't want the client to censor any information that's coming because remember the client is always in control. So let's say I ask a question, oh, can you tell me more about your soulmate? Are they in your life now? Well, let's say that that client's husband is sitting in the chair and the client is discovering that her soulmate was an ex-boyfriend or an ex-husband. Well, she's not going to feel like she can share that information with her husband sitting right there. Or let's say she does share it. She feels comfortable and she shares it. Well, he might not be comfortable hearing it because he can't unhear that after he hears it. And it can cause a lot of problems because maybe it's important that that client live out this lifetime with that person. Although he isn't her soulmate, there's a lesson, there's something they're working on together. So it can cause a lot of interference for the partner if they find out or discover that they're not the soulmate. But you're not always married to your soulmate. It could be well, your best friend. The soulmate can also take on an adversarial role, right? Yes, they can do that too. And, you know, there's, there's a, a learning that comes from that. Other than having to go to marriage counseling. <laughs> <laughs> or jail. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, there's some they're doing it out of love. They're playing the role, the adversarial role out of love right. to help their soulmate learn whatever lesson it is that they need to learn. They're saying, I love you so much and unconditionally that I will do what is required of me to help you. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask that question of you because there is a, a misconception that soulmates are always connected from the perspective of getting along and and the truth of the matter is that the roles may not play out like that at all right so i'm glad you explained that that's where you know a client could ha the the husband sitting in the chair over there could feel like they make a good team because they always get along and then be shocked to discover that although they do get along that's not their actual soulmate right right well, it's like I said, that's where the marriage counseling comes in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and the, the specialty guide that knows how to help the marriage counselor sort it out. <laughs> oh, too funny. Now, this all culminates when you're in the spirit world to going into seeing your council of elders or the wise ones. Yes, the planners, the wise ones, the council of elders. So what exactly is the Council of Elders. How is that different from a guide or a teacher? What will happen is your guide is there at some point and leading the review or, you know, taking you to points of interest in the spirit world. And then I'll ask, you know, would it be appropriate for us to go before the Council of Elders at this time? And it, it sounds like they're waiting for us or they've been waiting for this moment to happen or or it, sometimes it'll sound like a meeting is just adjourned and now it's your turn to go before your council. So it's kind of interesting how um, they describe that. And those wise ones that have been with you and help plan out your lifetimes here on earth. You know, there are more members on the council than there are. There are several members on your council where you might have one main guide. And sometimes it's, it's difficult to tell if they're guides or if they're a counsel, you know, when the client's describing the beings that are there helping them. But for the most part, the council have wisdom and insight about um, their lifetimes. Some of the council members might change out after a series of lifetimes. They might get more council members that help them. And they'll give insight into current life lessons, um, how they're doing at this stage of the game, what could be improved on. Clients, before we go there, will often feel like it's um, going to the principal's office, you know, like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. But once they get there, um, they, the council are often very loving. Occasionally, they'll be stern, firm, but usually they're very loving. What would be something that the council might uh, have to be more direct about than they otherwise would be with a soul? One thing that's coming to mind is where a client has had multiple LBL sessions, and here they are again, and the council will say, we've already told you that. We've already given you that answer. And I don't mean multiple LBL sessions with me. Um, you know, you do have those people that like to go and seek out 
many LBL therapists and have several sessions hoping they'll get a different answer. You're going into that space. You're going before the council. They're going to tell you what you need to know. And if you keep asking the same question, they're going to finally say, you know what? We've already shared that. That's interesting you should say that because there's two sessions that I've conducted that come to mind. One where a soul got into the council and the council was very, very kind, very loving, but said that they were not going to spend a lot of time in session, that there were some key messages and then they were going to wrap it up because uh, the council had explained that the soul knows very well what it needs to do. Yes. So they're not going to waste a lot of words and time, but they'll reiterate some things to kind of reinforce. And then I remember another session where when I asked the guide about the client going in to see the council, the guide had said that that was not something that was in order at this time. Yes. And, you know, going for the council, they might share with them uh, more about their current life, more insight into how they're doing at the stage of their life. This is a place where they might take a tangent and go review the past life from the LBL session or the past life with more insight from the day before. Right. They might share with them themes and information, themes that they're working on through a series of lifetimes. They might um, go into more detail about that. I mean, it's whatever the client needs at that time. But right. The council will they usually have a main leader that's leading the session, the council session, and there'll be other members there as well that might be familiar to the client. And one seems to be running the show, so to speak. How much does a council focus on past lives, or is the council's role more in line with the soul's overall development and character? It could be either. Okay. Um, but I would say it's... But they also have access to their um, soul's overall development and character. I guess it depends upon what the soul is actually requiring from a message and learning perspective then. Yes. Okay. All right. Fair enough. I was just wanted to ask you that question. The guide can share some of this information as well, but often this comes from the in front of the council. It could be either. Now, Bren, the visit with the Council of Elders, is that the last event or the last experience that the client or the soul experiences during the LBL session, or are there other stops in other places to go and visit and go see? Could you help us with that a little bit? It depends on what stage the visit to the Council occurred. They don't always experience the same segments in the same order as another LBL client might. Like they might do the welcoming committee and then the healing and restoration. They might go to a classroom. They might go to a learning group, soul group, and then go to the council as the last stop before they start to come back after the session. But that isn't always the case because there have been a few times where the first stop, once they went through healing and restoration and being welcomed, was straight to the council. Okay. As if they've been waiting for you, they want to share some information with you. It depends on where that visit falls in the scheme of what we've already covered as to whether the council visit is going to be the last piece before they come back. Okay. So the sequencing and the ordering in the spirit world can be whatever. So it's not this uh, this very stringent, we, we go here and then here and then here and then here. So it can vary. Yes. Okay. So what about now when clients have this experience, Bryn, and they come back, you bring them back from the spirit world, back into the chair, they emerge from the, um, from the session. What changes can they typically expect from having the experience? Well, there's a profound healing at an emotional level that takes place when you understand your soul's purpose, when you understand your immortality as a soul, you know, that this life is not the final, uh, the only life, that there's more to this and our being here. It opens up an, a state of awareness. You, you look at relationships differently. You have, there are different layers of understanding that start to come to a person. Right. Another thing that happens is that you're really surprised at how much time has passed. 
you know, in that state, it could be three to four hours that have passed, yet it'll feel like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, you know, because I'll ask, I'll ask the client, did that feel like a long time or a short time? And they'll say, oh, you know, that felt like a half an hour. And I'll say, well, you know, it's afternoon and that was three and a half hours. And they're just really surprised that that much time went by. So they, okay. they experienced time distortion. Time distortion, for sure. And occasionally I'll have the client that, you know, it felt like longer. <laughs> it felt like longer than what it was. Yep. But, you know, sometimes at the end of the session, you've been in that state for a long time. They may have even gotten up, had a restroom break and come back. There's a way to do that and continue the session and not break trance. And they're just tired because a lot has happened. A lot of energy is getting exchanged in this experience. But they're, they're in that state of awe at the profound experience and just that state of knowing that your soul continues on after this life to take you to its true home. Now, do you give your clients advice on activities that uh, or not to participate in activities before or after a session? Yes. Okay. Um, so some of the practical things I like to mention are come in with time so that you can rest. You know, don't get off of a plane or don't get out of traffic after a long day and come straight in to do a past life or an LBL. You know, you need to give yourself some space around it. Um, I want them to have eaten because I, I would hate for them to have the experience flowing and then all of a sudden they don't have enough fuel to keep going. Whereas if they had just eaten breakfast, they could have gotten through a longer session because it is taking a lot of energy. And then afterwards, I, I recommend that they not drive to drive like out of state. You know, don't drive a long distance after the session because um, you really need that time to integrate. You know, people, I know they have to get back to the, their lives and they have to do what they have to do. But, you know, there's nothing worse than having this really beautiful, profound experience and then having to go to traffic or your child's PTA meeting and you're trying to think of all the things and, re and just keep it alive and understand and integrate everything that just happened to you. And then you're having to do to focus and listen to them talk about whatever they're talking about or try to maneuver yourself through the airport when you just had this beautiful and profound experience. So, you know, I'm, uh, my office is here at the beach. I like to suggest to clients to plan on just spend the night at the beach, take that extra time, take a walk on the beach afterwards, have some quiet time, let it integrate, let it absorb. If, you, if you're local and you're going to be going home, find some quiet time without the kids, without activity. Make it lighter. Make it a quieter night because there's just a lot that's settling, you know, from the experience. And it'll settle for weeks and months and years. You know, it, it's just a really beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. And, you know, um, I had my LBL session with you. You were... The practitioner and I was the client five years ago back in 2009 I remember everything I experienced in that session like it was yesterday it was yeah. really so profound that those images are just seared in my mind and they were beautiful experiences yes I can tell you that and for those that are listening it was a game changer for me in my life it, it really was I mean I was on a path to make some changes in my life and if I needed that lift to get me up over that hurdle, it was that session. It was really quite remarkable. Yes, and a lot of, you know, knowing your purpose helps you have the confidence to step forward and do what it is that you know you need to do. Right. You might have had a feeling about it, or I might like to do this, but then it becomes clearer. It weeds out the distraction so that you can just get clearer on, okay, this is what I need to do. And I haven't looked back, you know, since I had... My LBL, I just remember saying, okay, this is what I need to do. I want to do this kind of work. And it's like pathways opened up there before me. And it was the obvious choice. It was that sense of knowing that we're talking about where it would come. It would be an opportunity. 
and you wouldn't have to think it through like you might think about stuff and overly think it. Right. It was, I know I need to do that. Very intuitive. Yes. So now we probably got a lot of people's interest peaked and they're asking the question, how do I set up an appointment with Brent? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I would suggest going to my website to just read some of the things that I have there to get a better feel for me and the work that I do. And then you can call my office and we'll set you up with an appointment and get you scheduled. BrynBlankenship.com? Yes. B-R-Y-N-B-L-A-N-K-I-N-S-H-I-P dot com. And the phone number is 910-620-0110. And what happens is people come and they'll have a session and it starts to pique their interest or they realize the benefits and how it's helped them. And then often they want to get into the field. And they want to become a hypnotherapist and a past life regressionist and a life between lives hypnotherapist. So I also teach and I really enjoy helping others to do what I'm doing. I like the learning experience of it all, you know, the, just the excitement, you know, seeing someone new, getting excited over the same things that I get excited about. And it's just, it's really a wonderful experience to help them along. And They'll take the course, they might take the hypnosis certification course and stop there, or they might continue and take the past life specialty course and stop there. And then others might choose to continue and do the Life Between Lives course through the Newton Institute, and that's an option as well. Now, your course information is on your website also? Yes. And we would be remiss if I didn't ask you about your books. I've been fortunate enough to be included in Michael Newton's book, Memories of the Afterlife. I have a chapter in there. And Brian Weiss's Miracles Happen, and I have a chapter in there. And I'm actually working on a couple of books of my own. I'm not going to, I don't have a release date at this time, but they're in the works. So in the not too distant future, those will be out as well. Well, very good, Bryn. And I just want to let everybody know, my audience, that Bryn is a friend and a colleague, and she is one of the very best in the field. And I think we got a lot of information out to our listeners. And I just want to say to everybody, if you have any other questions, you can uh, email Bryn directly and go to her website, BrynBlankenship.com. And, uh, or you can email me, and I will reroute those emails to Bryn if there's any inquiries about having sessions, taking the hypnosis course, or if you have any questions about our books. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for having me on. And as always, I really appreciate it. You're very, very welcome, Bryn. And we'll have you back on the show in the very near future. And that concludes my interview with Bryn Blankenship. And I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Bryn's website can be found at www.brynblankenship.com. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog, The Sage of Quay. Also, if you get a moment, please take a listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia, by heading over to laboroflovemusic.com. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.